All right. Hello, everybody. So uh, I'm really excited today to have um, our next industry insider in air quotes. Uh, but this guy actually is. He's he's uh, I think, Steve, I probably met you five, six years ago or something at a at a road rally and then have uh, had the pleasure of chatting with him a couple times since. And, um, you know, the whole idea of this industry insider series is hopefully to just pick the brains of some sec successful people in the industry and, uh, you know, both on the creative side and the and the business side and get some insights into what makes them successful. So plus, hopefully we can get some tips into uh, how you can accelerate your own path in music and maybe avoid some some pitfalls that that slow you down uh, unnecessarily. So uh, first of all, welcome Steve Barden. Thank you, Elliot. It's it's great to be on with you. It's great to have you here. Yeah. Uh, so I'll just give a bit of a, a proper intro to uh, to Steve. So um, he's a production music composer for film and TV, and uh, his music can be heard. I mean, shorthand might just say might just be saying his music can be heard everywhere. But I don't want to I don't want to shorthand you, Steve. So. Uh, Networks like ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox, ABC Family, A&E, American Heroes, Animal Planet, Biography Channel, Bravo, The Cooking Channel, I'm going to say the whole list, Discovery Channel, E, Food Network, Game Show Network, HGTV, Investigation, Discovery, Lifetime, MTV, okay, and about a dozen more. So uh, whatever channel you watch, you've probably heard Steve Barden's stuff before. Uh, so he's a, a multi-instrumentalist, plays guitar, piano, violin, and any other stringed instrument, or many others. I don't know if you've had a chance to play uh, the zither yet, or uh, oh, sitar, I but... <laughs> no, no, I, no, I have played sitar, yeah. Yeah, I'm not very, okay. I'm not very good at it, yeah. Yeah, okay. Because I, I play it like a guitar player, and you don't play it like that. Right, right. Um, and he's, so he's, uh, you know, got a long... Uh, uh, background with a lot of different instruments, but also he spent some time studying guitar at uh, what used to be called G GIT or the Guitar Institute. I guess it's Musicians Institute now. That's correct. Yeah, and uh, film scoring at UCLA. So, so this this is a this is a guy that's a force to be reckoned with. Um, and so a lot of uh, scoring work, uh, animated TV series seemed to be your specialty for a while, Steve. Um, I've got Tic Tac Tunes, Journey to the Heart of the World, Button Nose, uh, Baseball Card Shop, uh, which appeared on Nickelodeon, and some jingles and theme songs. So, wow. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. No, cartoons was something I was, I was, I was trying to be the next Carl Stalling. Uh, okay. I love the Warner, Warner Brothers cartoons. So, yeah, I, I absolutely love animation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's, yeah, why don't we just start with a, a bit of a summary of your journey? I mean, uh, it's, I'm sure it's, you know, it's with a resume like that, it's probably hard to piece it all together and what led to what, but mm -hmm. maybe give us some of the big blocks and how, how you think that, how you think you got here in, you know, five minutes or less. Um, I, yeah, probably the easiest way to describe it is by accident, which, you know, that's yeah. the way a lot of things work. Yeah. Um, you know, I started off as a music major in college and uh, uh, I started dating a woman. Uh, we eventually got married. She was a singer and we had a band and we uh, we traveled uh, the country, uh, you know, at all the holiday inns. Um, all the and, finest and, holiday inns, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, you know, in, until uh, until she got pregnant with our first child. And I realized, you know, gosh, I, I can't make a living playing in bar bands. Uh, you know, so I, I shifted my career and I got into computer programming, uh, which I'm, I'm still active in, but I'm, but I'm also composing. So I, I did go to college. I did major in music, um, but I always, you know, I always wanted to be a studio guitar player. And yet I was actually always composing. And I, if I had to do it all over again, I, I would be a composition major. But, mm -hmm. you know, it is what it is. Um, so, yeah, I was always doing arrangements for, you know, for the band and, and writing tracks um and then in in late 1985 i got my first tx four track porta studio right and I remember that was them. kind yeah. of that was kind of the beginning of you know yeah. multi-track recording and yeah. and i was always because i am a multi-instrumentalist i enjoyed the fact that i could lay down all these tracks of all these different instruments um i wasn't really a singer but i could play guitar and bass and 
uh, in those days for drum loops, we had a, a record called Drum Drops. And they were arrangements recorded by a real drummer in different styles. And you would just throw that on. And, and then you would, you know, these were common uh, uh, drum patterns and, and arrangements. And then you would just add your own chords and bass lines and melodies and stuff. Uh, so that was sort of the beginning of that. And then uh, towards the end of the 80s, the DX7 came out. And then you had these synths that, um, we, you know, were somewhat affordable. Um, samplers like the, you know, like the Akai, uh, I forget the number, 512 or something. Um, these boxes, you know, held like 32K of RAM. Of RAM. Right. Right. You know, so to do orchestral uh, writing, you needed like a dozen of these boxes, you know, so you could easily spend $50,000 yeah. uh, tr trying to be an instrumental composer, orchestral composer. Um, so that was sort of a little out of my reach, you know, uh, but eventually, you know, I started picking up uh, boxes like uh, Emu Proteus. They had a, a rock box and uh, Proteus 1 and the Proteus 2 was a, an orchestral box. Mm -hmm. And that's where I did a lot of my animation work, you know, and it was limited to the 16 MIDI channels. And so I had, uh, in those days, I was using Cakewalk, uh, a DOS program. This is even pre-Windows and uh, recording just MIDI tracks, you know. And right. so I had to do an, an entire orchestral arrangement with just 16 tracks. Yeah. And you, you sort of make do. And the articulations that were provided on those boxes were extremely limited. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you sort of had to uh, mold your arrangements and your writing into what these instruments were capable of doing, you know. And so it took a, a little while before these sampler boxes became uh, affordable. Uh, mm -hmm. and then, you know, Giga Sampler came out and then that sort of blew the top off of everything because you had unlimited sample size because it was streaming off of disk. Uh, sadly, they're no longer with us. Uh, yeah. But contact has really kind of taken over from that, and they've sort of become the de facto standard in sampling. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there's you know now the you know uh, east west they they shifted and built their own sampler and uh, sampler with uh, the play engine. Vienna Instruments has their own player, and actually Orchestral Tools is now going to be bringing out their own sample player. So we'll see how that goes. Mm -hmm. uh, but right now. If, if you look at composition from those early days to what you can do now, you know, as I mentioned, it would probably take about $50,000 minimum, yes. you know, to build a simple orchestral library. Yep. You can do that with just a few hundred dollars and a simple computer. Or uh, GarageBand on your phone. You know, <laughs> apps, you know, you can really do a lot with GarageBand, you know, yeah. especially as a tool for learning. Um, so th things have come a long way and I've been trying to, you know, grow with it and, and, uh, you know, in our, especially if you're doing orchestral music, the bar keeps getting higher and higher. So, you know, your this, your samples have to be really high quality. Yeah. And, um, you know, I it's, wonder it's though, a, yeah, I wonder what you what you think about this. So because I often think, well, you know, when I built my first studio in the this was in the early 90s, um, I had to get a bank loan for I think it was twenty thousand dollars to be able to have a 16 track studio. And. Just that barrier to entry, I think, kept the, I mean, there was less competition in, you know, in the recording space. But then a little bit later, if you wanted to be a composer and you actually had made the investment of five, ten grand to buy some samplers like you're describing, it wasn't a crowded space. <laughs> now, anybody can, the moment they open their lid on their new laptop, uh, if they have the skills, you know, produce functional production music in your case so do you do you see it as being necessarily a great thing that it's become so easy to make um commercial quality music now or or am i wrong is it still not easy well i i try to look at things as as a tool um it's like yeah you can go out and dig a hole in your backyard with a, with a spoon but, you know, we have shovels now, so why not use that? It's the same thing with these other production tools. Yeah. It just makes our life easier. Yeah. Um, I re remember having uh, an argument with a, uh, a, a another fr guitar player friend about, uh, I used to sort of despise tablature as, as a way to learn how to play the instrument. Because yeah. I sort of grew up with, you know, Mel Bay books. You know, you sat down in the, I didn't jam in the garage. I, I learned to read notes and play notes and stuff. And my friend said, you know what, 
if it encourages people to learn how to play the instrument and if they want to expand that, then later they can kind of move on and learn these other things. But as a way to introduce you to the instrument and, and get better at it, I see the same thing with, with these production tools as, as loops. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the, the, the big uh, thing right now with, with orchestral uh, libraries is, is performance-based uh, uh, things, mm -hmm. you know, um, playing trills and playing um, uh, lines, you know, melodic lines and things that to do it in a MIDI way, doesn't really work so you kind of have to go that way but anyway these are all just tools to 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 help you get better and you you yeah. can always learn more about orchestration and and any other production you know we're not just talking about symphonic music which is anything in the production world whether it's you know whether it's hip-hop edm uh, or rock or country or whatever yeah 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 okay so you so you sort of cut your teeth uh with these these big MIDI setups and and uh, surrounded by a uh, racks full of gear, I suppose, and um, just like moving forward through time. Then, so, so what was at what stage did you do? Uh, like I said in the intro, you um, had a formal education, U UCLA, uh, GIT. Was that was that right out of the right out of high school or right out of college, or did you? Did a little time go by and then you realized, hey, I need to go back and get get some more formal training? Well, I, I did go straight from high school in, into the university uh, yeah. as a music major. Uh, yeah. And my thing is that I wanted to be a studio guitarist. That was my, yeah. my career goal. And so I actually left the university and went to GIT and learned to play guitar. And I would hang mm -hmm. out with Tommy Tedesco. And we'd go to sessions, movie sessions. And it was, and it was really great. But yeah. at that time, the studio system was actually falling apart mm -hmm. uh, because of... of uh, home studios, the ability to do all these things, uh, low budget, you know, that really started changing things. Mm -hmm. So I started having to, you know, kind of rethink, you know, what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, and then, as I said, the, you know, the Porta Studio, the four track machine really kind of got me into doing production music. And I was always writing instrumental tracks without the thought of how this could be used. Yeah. Um, and I started you know, getting uh, some of my music in like corporate videos as background music, you know, not really understanding how it should be used, but just the idea that you can do that. Mm -hmm. um, and it really wasn't until early 2000, 2001 or something, or maybe it was 1999. Anyway, around that time, I had uh, a friend of mine is an artist, an animator, and he was doing a commercial for Time Warner Cable. Mm. And he said, Steve, you know, we need some music. Would, would you write something for this? And I said, sure. And we actually did. And we did a live band. We did a little jazz combo. And um, not really, you know, knowing much about how this stuff works. And I was just starting to learn about royalties and what the PROs do, ASCAP and BMI and stuff. So I did this music. I provided this music. We recorded it. Um, and I joined ASCAP and I registered it, hoping that something would happen. And years went by and I got a call from uh, somebody from ASCAP in, in New York and said, hey, you know, we, we've got some royalties with your name on it, you know, for these, these commercials. And I guess there were some, um, another composer who had also maybe written for a similar Time Warner commercial or something. So they had to kind of work out who was owed what. Yeah. And they said, we need you to fill out some paperwork so we can get this get this thing going. And I thought, oh, this is really cool. You know, I'm, you know, if this thing is worth five hundred dollars, it might be worth my time to, you know, mm. to do the footwork and get this done. So I did it all. And um, uh, a couple of weeks later, I got a check in the mail and it was for twenty four thousand dollars. Wow. Right. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's terrific. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I and I so that was I, your aha uh -huh moment, hey? Like, hey, there is a career to be made here. I said, I can do this. Yeah. I thought, well, this is really great. And then, as I said, you know, I was learning about royalties and stuff, and I, I went back to ASCAP and I said, well, you know, I'm actually the publisher. And they said, well, you just need to fill this out, and you need to get the uh, the ad agency to sign off on, uh, you know, that they're not claiming any rights to it, the publishing. And I actually went back to my friend, the animator, since he's the one who hired me, and he he signed a document and I sent it in and they sent me another check for $24,000. <laughs> 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 now, 
No, wow, granted, I, I haven't had I haven't had a payday like that since then. Yeah. But it just kind of goes to show you that there is money to be made in this business. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and really, it wasn't until I joined uh, Taxi A and R that I I started writing instrumental music for the purpose of getting into music libraries and mm-hmm. and doing production music. Well, um, yeah. So that's it's interesting that you mention that because uh, you know royalty rates, or let's say the 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 size of royalty checks has been steadily kind of sliding uh, because of the nature of the business. You know, there aren't three major networks anymore. Um, and, you know, a handful of ad agencies, there are hundreds or maybe there's thousands now. So I, I wonder how that's changed the way you approach writing. Um, and I guess what I'm leading you toward is whether or not it's true that Hey, you know, it's a numbers game now and you need to have like like a, a lot of people have, you know, kind of described like you need to have thousands of cues out there making you nickels but adding up to something like that $24,000 check. Mm-hmm. And you know, has that changed the way you approach uh you know, you mentioned before this call you're you're working on a cue right now. Um would you spend less time on it now just to get it out the door versus how you used to? approach it where you would maybe you know spend days or weeks obsessing over making it perfect uh just talk about whether that that whole kind of numbers game has has changed the way you write well the numbers game it it is it is true to make a lot of money because this is a a nickel and dime game uh uh the way royalties work are uh, uh major networks abc cbs nbc fox pay the best Okay. Cable networks like MTV and TLC and Animal Network, all those things pay a lot lower. And then it's also sort of based on uh, there's there's four periods in a day. There's prime time, which is you know seven to uh, uh, seven to midnight or eight to midnight, whatever. There's prime time. There's middle of the night. There's morning and there's afternoon. Uh, prime time pays a hundred percent. Mornings pay fifty percent. Afternoons pay three quarters and then night yeah. the middle of the night pays like 25 percent so it depends on on your placements uh obviously and and the number of reruns uh, that occur uh the problem with with cable networks is why they pay so low is because they have 24-hour programming and there's hundreds of these cable channels and they have to have tons of content yeah and most of these are uh reality shows and there's an unwritten rule in reality TV that you need uh, wall-to-wall music, and because uh, unwritten rule that there can be no silence. Yeah. So if there, if if the people on, on the show are not talking, there needs to be something going on audibly. It has to be yeah. music. And to hire a single composer to to write that much music is is unfathomable. Yeah. So that's where the music libraries come in. Um, so you do need to have. In order to make a lot of money, you do need to have a lot of tracks out there. So, one, you need to write a lot of music. You need to get a lot of music in music libraries, unless you know these music supervisors yourself and get a get a direct placement. Yeah. Um, and then these uh, music library tracks have to get placed on a show. So, as we said, I'm working on a new track right now. This is for for a new client of mine. Um, so I don't want to in the beginning because I was just learning the business. I would get as much music as I can in as many libraries as I can. So the problem with that is that, I mean, one, it's good experience, but your music is going to just sit, uh, sit on the shelf. Okay. Collecting dust. It may get placed. It may not likely that it's not. Um, so now that I've learned a lot about the business and, and my writing skills have improved, I try to be more targeted in my approach to get my music out there. Mm-hmm. I want to work with clients that, uh, especially when a client comes and says, we, we have a show that they want music for. So I'll write music for that show. And then it goes into their library. And not only will it get on that show, then it gets used for other shows, hopefully. Um, so if a client just says, uh, you know, I'm, uh, we're looking for, you know, reggaeton music, just submit tracks. I, I'm not going to do that because it's 
it kind of a waste of my time because I have other opportunities I can I can target. I don't have unlimited time. I have to write the best quality music that I can and to get it in the, the potentially best situations that I can right mm-hmm. now. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's it's a numbers game. Yeah, and it seems like a, a lot of, uh, well, a lot of the subscribers that I see in Magnatrax, their catalogs are so varied. They're doing hip hop, they're doing some orchestral stuff, they're doing um, just all over the map. And on one hand, I you think, well, I mean, it must be nice to be expert level at all those things, at all those genres. But I, I kind of think that it, it can't be true that you, you know, you can be not only just good at all these genres, but also keeping up on what's next. Like, where is that genre going next? And to be really dialed into what what people want to hear or what, let's say, uh, editors want to hear. Uh, on reality TV, so do you do you feel like it's a good idea to to really try to specialize, or or is it just good, basically like um, good exercise to take on genres that you haven't before, just to see, you know, hey, let's let's push my creative chops a little bit here. What do you think? Yeah. You know, what's what's a better yeah. approach? Well, absolutely. I mean, the more styles and genres you can write in, uh, the better off you're going to be ultimately. Yeah. But most people are not good in in everything. I I think no one is really. Um, I'm not an EDM guy. I stay away from EDM because that's just not what I feel comfortable writing. Um, But there are a lot of other genres that I can write. Um, You know, I talk about in my book about finding success early when you're just starting in this business. And that is write, start with things that you are really, really good at. You feel Mm -hmm. comfortable with, you, you know, you are authentic. Because if you try to write reggaeton and you're and it's not authentic, people will know. You you know your mom might think it sounds like what <laughs> you know what you're trying to describe. But if it's not authentic, uh, you know it's it's going to fail. It's it's never going to get placed. Right. So find success early. Do things that you do really well, and find placements in that. Then you can start expanding your knowledge base and learn these other genres. You know, mm-hmm. but you really have to do your homework and be good at it. Yeah, and I think just even further to that, once you've had some success, that also means on the other side of it, you've impressed a music library with your ability to deliver. And now you've got an ally that, hey, you know, Steve's the guy I go to for reggaeton or for, uh, you know, or for maybe it's smooth jazz or whatever. So now you've, you've, you've kind of established that toehold that maybe you can begin to leverage into, into some other opportunities that are a little bit of a side genre from where you started but i i think i I think that's great advice i mean if you start i remember when i i used to have a a a little group of composers that we'd go out and get um project work for and in onboarding those composers i'd say well what are you good at oh i do everything i mean i can do anything just throw anything you can at me which means that i can do nothing well and, and that's very, that's very true. And your reputation is everything. So if you claim that you can do everything, or claim even one style, and y- you you don't fulfill those promises, yeah, the client's going to stop calling you. Okay. Right. So you have to be believable, and you have to you have to earn their respect. Right. Right. You mentioned your book, and I I realize I didn't mention it off the top, but uh, writing production music for TV: The Road to Success, which you can just see over your right shoulder there, uh, it's becoming a staple. I've seen that book in so many places now. There you go, yeah, great book. And so I'm curious about. I guess there's a couple of things I want to ask you about about the book. But first of all, like, at what point did you feel like? Hey, you know, I've got some knowledge worth sharing here that I think I think I've got enough to fill a book. I mean, was there a was there a certain moment for you where you really felt like you had a handle on how production music works? And yeah, absolutely. I mean, first of all, the the, the book came about because the publisher that uh, Center Stream Publishing that um, I've known the publisher for probably tw- at least twenty years, and I've done mm. a lot of work for him over the years, and he's always been trying to get me to write a book. And as a guitar player, I just thought, what, what can I write about guitar that hasn't already been written, you know? Yeah. And um, I just started thinking about what have I been doing, like, a lot the last 10 years, and that's all this yeah. production music stuff. Yeah. Um, and I, I've learned so much, and, and of course, you know, I have a lot of uh, colleagues that have 
you know, even more experienced than I do that, you know, are just very open and sharing. Um, and so I, I just thought, I, you know, I, let me just put all this information in a book because there really wasn't anything out there like this uh, at all to, right. to learn the nuts and bolts of production music. Yeah. Uh, so we covered, you know, from A to Z. And uh, originally I thought, well, maybe I'll, I'll do uh, a volume, separate volumes in these different categories. And, yeah. and I don't know. It just ended up just being everything in one book. Yeah. What I love about it is that you've got a nice blend of, you know, here's how this business works. And it's I think it's been in the blind spot in the music industry for a long time that there's actually a real um, uh, there's a real industry here for uh, maybe what were in the past struggling songwriters that were trying to get album deals or or you know were trying to pitch themselves as an artist and they realize well hey this is there might be more money in this now that nobody's buying records anymore. Um, That's true. That's a big part of the shift. Yeah. And this is a legitimate industry now. And so even if you're not truly an instrumental composer, if you're a songwriter, yeah. you can turn those vocal tracks into instrumentals, you know, mm -hmm. replace replace the vocal with a, a melody instrument. Yeah. And, and I love how you go into like some of the technical specifics, because it's not just about here's the music I've got. I hope you find a place for it, Mr. Music Supervisor. You know, there's a lot of real specific delivery requirements and there's a you know there's um just the idea of having to give several versions of the same track with different combinations of instruments and you know in different edit lengths that are editor friendly you have to think like a music editor would and you give some really good specifics on that in the book which i think the average songwriter just thinks well everything that comes out of my mouth is you know from it fell from heaven <laughs> but there's there's a framework you need to stick within when you're writing for for production um, uh, opportunities, isn't there? Yes, and, and you you have to consider what the reason is why this music is is behind something uh, on a TV show. Uh, it's to support the visuals, right? You're conveying an emotion that to support what's happening. Right. Um, one of the biggest uh, things, and I've learned this just from experiences um, working with music that is going to be played behind uh, dialogue. And be, as production music, we're not scoring to picture like a film composer would. So we don't know how, how this is going to be used. So your music could be sitting behind dialogue. So that's why we have different versions of our tracks, one that doesn't have a melody um, that, that would interfere. And, and then you do have the version with you know the melody. And then the music editor can uh, uh, pan in and out the, the different versions of the track. Right. So, Steve, I wanted to ask you a little bit about just some of the changes in the industry that, you know, we've seen in the last, I don't know, I guess it's been about 10 years or so, uh, where really uh, a songwriter or a composer just having so many ways that you can go. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems like, you know, I see a lot of writers that, focus so much on just building a Facebook following or a Twitter following or, um, you know, getting their SoundCloud uh, following to be a thousand or 10,000 people. And so I wonder, and I wanted to ask you about just what you think the value in having a big social presence is, uh, at least in, in, in your space, you know, in the production music space specifically. For songwriters, I definitely think you still have to uh, have some kind of social presence. Now, uh, you know, it wasn't that long ago when MySpace was the de facto standard for showcasing independent right. artists. Um, now it's become maybe Twitter, but uh, Instagram, um, uh, SoundCloud for sure. Um, the difference now in, in terms of, you know, the social presence for instrumental music, um, I have talked to numerous people that have said that uh, a music editor found you know his tracks on a, a thing you know do you want to write for this library uh, i have not personally experienced that <laughs> uh, but you know it's who knows you know i guess if if you tag your your files uh, properly you know so people can find you know stuff that they're looking for um and and do you do you put music up on these these sites that are not published yet? You know things that are available for licensing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know there's 
all these issues with if your music is signed exclusively to one publisher or if it's non-exclusive and you have it uh, um, with multiple publishers um, you know there's a lot of things to consider but the exposure you know just showing what you can do uh, that that can be good uh, probably not as much for instrumental composers as vocal songwriters uh, right. but it's it's still you know something that you should consider doing mm -hmm. well you know if you're if you're just starting out and um you know you're trying to think of ways like you know i, I most people they're going to start out with their day day gig you know they're still working a 40 50 hour week or maybe if they're in hospitality they're working you know long nights and and so they're trying to squeeze their music into a little gap in their calendar uh, and so they're thinking, hey, I got two hours a day. I want to just make the most of my of my efforts here. Uh, yeah, I could tweet about a bunch of stuff that I've been doing. I could, you know, um, I could learn the, the, some new plugin that I just got for Logic. Um, it seems to me like, you know, this still, even with all the change that has happened in music, it's still a relationship business. Uh, oh, it, for sure. You know, as much as we think that that music has become like a commodity, which it kind of has, it has been a little bit devalued over the years. The people that do well at it are the ones that are well liked, and you know, people will do favors for the people that they like. And so I I always think that that's that's really where you should put your time in. Is just you know, you mentioned off the top, um, the taxi road rally. Uh, I know you and I have seen each other at the production music conference in LA. Things like that are, are where you actually build real friendships, not Facebook friendships. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wonder if, if if you feel the same way that it's you know you, you, it's probably time really well spent to just try to build relationships, however that is. Maybe you've got some tips on building relationships. That is that is key in in really in any industry. Uh, yeah. But especially in the music industry, it, it really is who, who you know. So mm -hmm. if you don't live in a, a major music hub like uh, L.A., Nashville, New York, yeah. um, where you're running into people all the time, uh, you need to get out at least once a year to some kind of conference where you start getting to meet people, getting to know them. Mm -hmm. Um, but on a personal level, you know, the worst worst thing you can do is, you know, see somebody that you want to get your music to and you just bombard them with your, you know, here, right. listen to my CD. And, right. Um, right. you know, that's not building a relationship. You know, mm -hmm. you're just you're just being annoying. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, like the Taxi Road Rally and PMC, these kind of conferences, ASCAP Expo. Mm -hmm. uh, there's numerous others, probably even uh, South by Southwest. You can go to events. Uh, but as you go to, you know, the same people go to these things year after year after year. So if you start going to these events and you start meeting people and getting to know them on a personal level, uh, that's certainly going to help open a lot more doors mm -hmm. than just uh, blindly uh, cold calling somebody uh, right. or, you know, cold emailing as, as we do today um, because you're you're just a, another Joe off the street, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I wonder. I mean, even having said that, and and for sure, I see that a lot at at uh, the road rally specifically, where people are they still show up with CDs or sticks or whatever, and they're swarming the speakers as they get off the stage. You know, listen to my stuff, and um, I think, okay, I mean, you have to, you just have to let the conference come to you. You have to talk to the person you happen to be sitting with, mm -hmm. and you know, talk to the person in the lunch lineup and. And not not necessarily have this agenda. Um, however, I wonder if on the flip side, it still makes sense to go into one of these conferences and, and do a little bit of research. Who's going to be there? Uh, who might I want to talk to if I get the chance? Uh, I mean, do you ever kind of prep yourself for for a conference and and um, at least have some a little bit of a set of goals that you want to accomplish while you're there, or maybe just things you want to learn? You, you absolutely need to do some reconnaissance and find out yeah. who's going to be there and what they're representing. Because yeah. if you, you hand somebody a CD that doesn't use the kind of music that you write, you, you, it's, you're just wasting your time. 
And one of the things I, I recommend to people all the time is that if, you, for example, you want to get your music uh, in music libraries, well, what kind of music do you write? Find shows on TV, and this is part of doing your research, that use that kind of music, especially in reality shows. You watch the, the end credits, and typically that you're going to see a credit that says music provided by, and they're going to list one or two or three music libraries that they always yeah. use. Those are the libraries that you contact and say, look, I, you know, I, I saw that you, you have music on show X, Y, Z. Uh, I have music that I think that fits that show mm -hmm. exactly. You know, would you care to listen to it? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's one approach, but it's the same thing is then find out who these people are that work for these libraries. Uh, when you go to these conferences, if, if they're there, those are the people you want to target. You want to try to get to know a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, and it doesn't mean that anything's going to, you know, happen right away. Uh, yeah. And I don't want to say that handing somebody a CD cold is not going to work because it actually worked for me at, at a rally. I met Kevin Kiner. Kevin mm. Kiner was uh, doing CSI Miami at the time, and I gave him a CD. And, and he was just, you know, we chatted for a moment, and he was very yeah. nice. And he said, oh, cool, man, I'll listen to it. And, you know, and I, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, sure, you know. Circular file, just, you're thinking. Yeah, everybody's <laughs> bombarding with, with, with CDs, you know. Yeah. And then about 10 days later, I got a phone call from him. And yep. he actually asked me to if I'd like to write on on one of the shows he's he's the main writer for. Mm -hmm. And that relationship has actually grown. And last season, I, I got to write on Jane the Virgin. Ah. You know? So it's, you know, it, it can happen. But um, yeah. for the most part, no. <laughs> yeah, I guess the main thing is you don't want to be known as the guy that does that. Because then, I mean, that stuff spreads real quick, too. You know, yeah. Uh, I know yeah, I, I've been in a circle of, you know, people having a casual talk and some somebody will enter the circle and suddenly tilt the conversation to them and what they're doing. And you can just tell that they're so anxious to get some attention that it, it just, mm -hmm. you know, you, you become known as this pushy salesman type person that uh, you just don't want to hang around with. You know, it, we're just it's just like in any other space, yeah. uh, any other place in life. You want somebody to just be cool. Yeah, you know, <laughs> and, and and of course, yeah, we all want approval for for what we do. Yeah, uh, the thing is, though, that if if you do get somebody to listen to your music, man, your music better be awesome. Mm. You know, because mm -hmm. if you're just giving them subpar material, right, you've wasted their time. Yep. They're not going to want to talk to you again. You know, so make sure that you've reached that level of of being able to work for these people that you're trying to get to. Right. So apart from just the way you approach and, and build contacts with people, uh, are there a few things that you see that you think separates pros from beginners in production music? Um, like, are there, are there certain, you know, principles that you need to always adhere to? You want to present yourself as a professional that's easy to work with, because I, I know in production music, things move fast. Has, is that something that you've noticed? Is that um, being easy to work with is one of the things? Right. Well, easy to work with usually means that you're experienced and you, you don't have to ask a lot of newbie questions. Right. So if you keep coming back to somebody and saying, well, what do you mean by this? You know, what what do you mean by um, a button ending? Um, mm -hmm. You know, what do you mean by uh, an edit point? Right. You need to know these things ahead of time um, if you want to, you know, move quickly th through the business, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and get up to the top. Um, and that's, you know, that's what I'm trying to cover in my book is to, you know, to give you all this information so right. you don't make these mistakes up front and you can move along faster. Right. But yeah. Right. You, you need to be easy to work with. You need to be professional. Uh, nobody likes criticism, but you need to take criticism as a learning experience and right. put your ego aside and figure out why didn't the client like that and mm -hmm. it might not be because your music was bad it's, it just it didn't fit what they were looking for right and you right. need to you know not take it personally mm -hmm. yeah and that's where um it would seem to me like just having a lot of irons in the fire you know having multiple libraries that you work with uh, multiple publishers that you've got good relationships with, 
uh, it, it makes you less defensive of your music because I'm sure a guy like you, Steve, if, if somebody says, well, we don't really like this cue you did, you say, okay, fine. There's somewhere else that I can put it to. You know, exactly. So you don't exactly. then sit there trying to defend why it's right. <laughs> and I, I try to tell people to not fall in love with everything that they do. I mean, mm -hmm. you have to write the best quality music that you can. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, we're just creating widgets. Okay, mm -hmm. we're, we're a production factory. We're creating usable product that can be used in television that fits a need and it's formatted in a way right. that's accessible and usable. You know, it, you can't worry about every little note because you've got more music to write. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I think a lot of the pushback, you know, when you talk about production music and, and I mentioned in the beginning, you know, artists, they're, they're much more precious about what they've created. And, and it's natural with lyric pieces, especially, you know, these are, these are feel, deep feelings that you're expressing in song mm -hmm. and it's, and it, it's very easy to say, hey, you know, uh, you don't like my song. Well, in a way, you don't like me. <laughs> and so maybe with instrumental music, it's a little bit easier to become, mm -hmm. to be detached from it. Because it's like, it's not a, when you don't like this piece, you're not saying something about my childhood or the, my first love or whatever it is I'm writing about. You're just saying you don't like the mood. You don't like the patch I selected as my uh, cello. <laughs> um, so I, I think also, you know, for a lot of creative people, working in production music is is uh, there's a little bit less of a uh, personal connection to the music, just naturally, because mm -hmm. it's it's music. They all, it all has a space, uh, but it doesn't necessarily match with the picture you're trying to support, and that's okay. Yeah, and, and vocal songs, uh, especially, and maybe this is why I'm, I'm not doing it. I mean, I, I, I've been a songwriter before, and it's just not my thing. Um, but there is something about writing songs for television mm. in that your, your lyrics have to be universal. You know, you can't write the same kind of songs that you would for a, a, a top 40 radio hit that you would uh, on television, because you, you can't you can't be specific about locations or names of people. Um, you know, I, I love you, Mandy. Needs to be just I love you, girl. Yeah. You know, that Sticking with this idea of being being new in the industry and some of the mistakes that you might make, and we've talked about you know relationship tips and um, and how to sort of become emotionally detached from your music, at least in a in a healthy way. You don't want to be completely detached from what you create. But um, I wonder also about the the uh, uh, artists or producers or composers that get really obsessed, and you see this all the time in forums, um, really obsessed about uh, the, the DAW you're using, the mic you're using, the preamp, the plugins, you know, and you see these kinds of questions like, uh, well, what, what version of Omnisphere are you using and what was that patch? And you're just getting laser focused on, on what I think are the wrong things because some mm -hmm. great art has been produced out of GarageBand or even before that out of a Porta Studio. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Depends how far back you want to go, you know, or Motown days, all everybody huddled around one microphone. Exactly. So um, but what's, your, what's your feeling of, about people that are, these so-called gear sluts. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there is, that's a danger. There's a lot of gear envy. And, and I love, like, um, uh, there's a, a forum on the internet called VI Control. Mm. And that's where people talk about all the latest sample libraries and stuff. Yeah. And I, I, it's a love-hate relationship because every time I go there, people are talking about some new library. And I just think, God, I really want that library because everybody's talking about it. Um, but you you know you can't own all of them or if you do you know you're going to go bankrupt at some point because this yeah. stuff adds up yeah. you, you you don't need it if, if you think you you know you need it uh, i i try to tell people to you know not go into debt over over buying gear make stuff work as your as your business grows and you start mm -hmm. making money then you need to reinvest it into updating your gear mm -hmm. but but don't hurt yourself and your family uh, especially if you have mouths to feed, um, 
do what you can. You know, the Beatles, you know, people talk about this all the time. The Beatles only had four tracks of of, of tape uh, to work with back in the early days. You know, they did uh, Sergeant Pepper on four tracks and they just kept transferring it over to another four track machine. Yeah. You know, and, that, and then, you know, multi-track tape decks got into 24 tracks and 32 tracks and 96 tracks. And, um, you know, you can get way overproduced and it doesn't make your music that much better. Mm -hmm. So as far as the DAW that you're using, which is the best DAW, it's the one that you're used to. The right. one that you know really well and you can get things done. Mm -hmm. Every I, I think there's an, an equal playing field now with DAWs. Um, I actually, I just switched to Cubase a year ago yeah. because I, I was a Cakewalk user since yeah. the 80s, since they started. Yeah. And, and Gibson let the product die. And before this other company picked it up, I had made a decision to switch and I went to Cubase. Mm -hmm. And they, they pretty much do all the same thing. Now, there are some features that Cubase has that I like better than Cakewalk. But then there were some things that Sonar did that, that yeah. Cubase doesn't do. Yep. So, you know, they're all about the same. And the same goes for PC versus Mac. I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, you get into these debates about, uh, or even iPhone versus uh, Samsung Galaxy. Or, mm -hmm. You know, at some point, it's Coke or Pepsi. Whichever you like, they're both exactly. doing the same job. I don't think anybody's got a real competitive advantage over anybody else. And just get good at it. Whatever yes. you can move quickly around, you know, know all those shortcuts, those shortcut keys and... And uh, all those hidden features, I mean, that's that's what it's about. It's just yeah. creating quickly, getting in, getting out. Yeah. You know? and don't get hung up saying, if, if only I had this tool, right. would it make my music better? Right, yeah. Now, having said all that, if you, you, know, if, if you want to write, um, let's say, uh, high-impact orchestral music for a show like The Amazing Race, uh, I, I mean, there's a certain tool set that you need to have so i mean what what would you say is that balance between out of the box sounds and getting into gear envy mm -hmm. you know you know i i love the native instruments complete package if you are just starting out and and i i have no relationship with their their company yeah. um, because you can spend so much money on these different libraries if you were to invest I think it's like $1,200 on Complete Ultimate. It has pretty much everything you need, mm. you know, for doing action music and EDM music and uh, Cuban music. It has all these different plugins that are fantastic. Mm -hmm. Now, you can always upgrade to uh, Berlin Strings or Spitfire Strings or, you know, get into these other expensive libraries. But, you know, rather than spend $30,000 investing in this stuff, start off with a tool that is reasonable and can get the job done. You can always add on to that. Right. So safe to say that, you know, with a pretty recent laptop and uh, $1,200 for complete and then a microphone and a preamp, you've run out of excuses. Pretty much. <laughs> you know, the, the preamps, they're all USB based now. Yeah. Uh, you, you, if, if you're not doing microphone stuff, like I do everything in the box, mm -hmm. even though I'm a guitar player, I, I rarely do guitar music. But if I do, I, I have a, uh, uh, what is it? It's an M Audio M Track uh, uh, USB based um, yep. uh, thing. And I, I can plug in a couple microphones. And, um, uh, and actually, the microphone that I use when I do guitar is um, a, a Gage uh, EM87. And it's, you know, it was like $100 when I bought it. I think it's a couple hundred dollars now. Uh, but you can get some really decent sounds by today's technology, you know, whereas mm -hmm. 20 years ago, you would have had to spend 10 times that amount. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, it seems like just thinking about a lot of home studio uh, producers and, and, and artists, songwriters, it seems like the way music is made now is, is, isolating in a way you know we're all we've, we've got a spare bedroom or, or a corner of your apartment or whatever that is your music space where it used to be that you would you know book a cheap studio and go and and you know get together with some friends and and lay down tracks and um i just wonder about about the you know um almost like a, a mental health 
this is almost like a mental health question. And, you know, you've got people making music in isolation where for thousands of years we've been, it's been a social uh, experience. And, um, and I, I think that, and hopefully you agree that there's, there's, you need to make a real effort now to connect, to almost fill up that creative tank, you know, to get, get some new ideas in there and, and, and not just from surfing around online, listening to other people's work, but actually being around live music or, or even other songwriters talking about their craft. Um, do you, do you think that this is something that you should be working into your schedule if you are a bedroom songwriter or, um, mm -hmm. yeah. So if you can't get in the same room with another musician composer, yeah. Uh, just so you have some feedback, you can, you know, go back and forth on, um, yeah. a lot of people are doing collaboration over the internet, which is, which is fine. Yeah. Uh, you do your stuff, you send the MIDI tracks or the audio tracks to mm. your collaborator and they send them back. That's useful too. Um, uh, I, th I think we have lost a little bit. Uh, there is a lot of sterility in, in music because we're, we are so isolated, mm. um, and it also making us introverts. You know? mm -hmm. We're not getting out there and, and, and talking to people. Right. Um, yeah. But it's the same thing with everything else, you know, with, you know, video games and, and, and TV and, you know, yeah. nobody goes to movie theaters anymore. And um, yeah, yeah uh, society's changing, you know, and yeah. uh, it's a challenge. But yeah, you know, try, try to be with people whenever possible. Well, uh, you know, we've talked about the taxi road rally and we talked about the, um, a production music association their conference um what about on a local level or, like I, I remember that we used to have a really i'm up in vancouver and we used to have a real strong nsai chapter mm. um is is that uh, you know do you have any favorites that, that you'd want to share that would be good kind of um places to try to find other people that are in the same boat as you if you're not in la or if you're not in new york uh, um uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I mean, I've, I've spoke at NSI, NSIA events, AI events, AI, uh, like, this, uh, like this one down in San Diego, which is, you know, a couple hour drive for me, yeah. uh, even though I'm in LA. Uh, I guess it kind of depends on what, what your focus is, because, yeah. you know, uh, the, that's primarily for songwriters, you know, as opposed to uh, instrumental. In fact, there was a there was a meet up in LA here for trailer composers. I, mm. I, I wasn't able to attend, uh, but there are like minded groups. I mean, you kind of have to search them out, yeah. uh, but you, you need to try to, to be around people that are kind of doing the same thing or similar things that you're doing just to kind of share ideas. Yeah. Um, I, I ran into a bunch of composers uh, at the NAMM show uh, recently in, mm. in, in Anaheim. Mm -hmm. uh, that you know some people i've only known from online you know so when you get to meet these people you get to kind of talk about things like just even hey what are you working on what kind of what kind of trends are you seeing in the industry what are what kind of problems are you running into mm -hmm. you know just have you know it's it's kind of like um uh like therapy in, in a way yeah. uh, i have i have a group of composers um uh, in los angeles that actually started out of the taxi road rally where it's sort of the same idea, uh, but it's just people in the LA area and we get together once a month and mm -hmm. we've been doing this for seven years. Yeah. And I treat it, I treat it as like therapy, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, like now we're a big family and we, we talk about the industry and, um, yeah. you know, people are, everybody's doing different styles of music and stuff, you know, mm -hmm. and there are some songwriters in the group as well. It's not just instrumental composers. Mm -hmm. So just having a collective of people, you know, to talk with is really helpful. So it doesn't have to be like songwriters anonymous or, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, specific organizations just finding, uh, I mean, you can put these things together yourself in your community, uh, yeah. you know, put up an ad in Craigslist or something and say, you know, we're, we're looking for, you know, people to just hang out. You know, yeah, or, or set up a meetup or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, in fact, oh, there is, yeah, there is that uh, service meetup.com. Mm -hmm. And you can find all kinds of stuff, uh, you know, for music related stuff. It's it's yeah. really important. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Steve, this, this has been great. I've, I, I think there's a lot here that you've given us to think about. And, uh, and there's a lot more in writing production music for TV, The Road to Success. And I hope the people will pick it up. Uh, 
like I said before, what I like is it's got a lot of sort of high level stuff, but then also real detailed uh, tips and, and um, you know, things that you can apply every day um, to, to forging a career in production music. And if that's your thing, I mean, uh, that's, that's just a great solid way, I think, to build a, a dependable living in music, which is hard to say. I mean, if you're a, if you're a touring musician or, or you're relying on performances, as we know, that's that's hit or miss. But it seems like the production music space is one where you actually build a, a nice recurring revenue stream that you can start to kind of plan for. And uh, and yeah, I like to call it a retirement plan. It's it's something mm -hmm. that you can do until the day you die. It's yep. not like performing in a band where you have to be up in front of an audience and waiting yep. for a gig. You can yep. be doing this anytime. Uh, you don't have to be young and beautiful to do it. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to know how to dance. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you do it for your love, and and there's there's I call it mailbox money. It just comes in uh, yeah. every quarter, and you know it's it's good retirement money. Awesome. And you know, just further before I forget, on that point of uh, finding a local place uh, for some, you know, like finding local groups, people that do what you do, and just uh, a little bit of camaraderie. I know that Music Connection publishes i think it's music connection publishes a list of all the music events in the world that they know mm -hmm. of and it's a huge list and you find your city on there and there'll be you know for sure there'll be a, a handful of events you hadn't even heard of but right. um that, you know often they're free so um just wanted to add that i'm going to also add a link to uh, steve's book underneath the, the description in this video and I uh, just want to say thanks again, Steve. I really appreciate your time on a Sunday morning here. All right. Take care. All right. Thanks so much.